in many ways, Malcolm Gladwell is just as complicated, but I think his style is different. Right? This reading, this tipping point reading, I just asked you to do two things with it, right? I asked you just to do two things, and that was tell me about the title, right? What is the tipping point? And then be able to tell me something about these examples. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to actually use both of these concepts this entire term to unpack the history we need to deal with. But we've got to understand what they were arguing first if we're going to do that. So uh, what, what is a tipping point? What comes to mind when you hear this term, tipping point? Somebody saw you reading uh, this, <laughs> this reading in Starbucks. What would you say when they asked you, hey, what is a tipping point anyway? Like what kind of word association comes to mind? We'll talk about what a tipping point is, and then we'll get into just a couple of examples and then take a break. What's a tipping point? Nike, like I'm the mm -hmm. first person, okay. and all of a sudden, like the next day, you see them all over the stores. All over the place. You cause something to tip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, it's good that you bring up the kind of fashion example too, because that's the first example we'll talk about. Uh, one of his fashion examples. So that's good. This notion of tipping point. Others? Yes. Okay. This moment when anything, everything changes, right? He talks about that in the, in the text. It's the point where everything seems to change all at once. You can think about September 11th as a tipping point in American history, not the only one. Uh, there are many tipping points which we will study. Civil War and Reconstruction and Revolution, all these sorts of things might be tipping points, these moments where everything changes. Yes? So when you said something drastic, like Good. Drastic change. This is another good one. Now, again, I, this always struck me because, um, you know, in my training as a historian, we were really taught to deal with cause and effect, like long-term factors change over time to pay attention to such things and kind of see how things work. So, for example, if you're looking at, a, you know, the history of the U.S., okay, um, you have a revolution and a declaration of independence and a constitution put in place, and then, okay, what's this nation going to look like, right? How do we imagine this nation being formed? And then suddenly things seem to keep happening that are fortunate for us. Uh, 1803, the Louisiana Purchase will kind of fall into our laps, right? We'll write a check and double the size of the country, get 13 states out of it for only $15 million, right? That's less than Mike Trout makes. That's, a, that's, that's fantastic, right? The size of the country doubles. This is great. Maybe we'll eventually achieve manifest destiny, reaching the Pacific Ocean, even though that term didn't exist yet. We already had it in our minds. So this is fantastic. Well, now we have all this new territory. How do we imagine that territory looking? Immediately, issues will emerge about Western expansion. Should these new states be slave states or free states? There's going to be conflict around that. How are we going to manage that conflict with, within this imagined community? For a while, we'll manage it through various compromises, which we'll study, 1820, 1850. But eventually, we're not going to be able to manage that conflict. Right? It's going to lead to civil war. So historians are very comfortable with like long-term factors and change over time, right? 1800, 1803, 1804, 1805, 1803, and then 1861, shots are fired. We're at civil war, right? Gladwell says, that's great. Those long-term factors are important, but you've got to look at that tipping point, right? That moment where everything changes, maybe never to go back the way it was before. Maybe an even better example. The Great War, the Great War, which we now call World War I. Now, the Great War in world history is a very important tipping point. But I would argue that you have to understand the tipping point aspect of it and the longer term factors. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. June 28, 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is killed in Serbia. Right? Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife get shot. June 28, 1914. Within a month, the world is at war. It's like, wait, what? People get shot every day. Why does this lead to the death of 10 million people? Okay. So yes, that was a tipping point. But you also had to understand these longer term factors if you're going to understand that event. One of those factors is going to be nationalism, national rivalries. Rivalries between Britain, Russia, 
Germany and Austria-Hungary and these other nations, right? Britain and Germany are modernizing, they're industrializing, they're trading with each other, but they're also both looking at each other suspiciously, right? Man, your navy's kind of looking pretty good there. Maybe we need to build our navy up. So even though they're trading partners, there's some tension developing. This national rivalry and tension, this competition for colonies, of which we were a British colony for a long time, right? This tension is ultimately powerful enough that even family members will kill each other. Right? The leaders in Russia and Germany and England are cousins. How are they going to be in a war for four years killing each other? Because nationalism is that powerful. Rivalry is that powerful. Even to overcome blood relationships. So I would argue to understand the Great War, we are, yeah, we've got to understand that June 28th event that also had to do with nationalism. But we also have to understand these longer term factors, economics, politics, nationalism, so on and so forth. Right? So yeah, I think this concept can help us in a number of ways, right? This concept can help us in a number of ways. Um, Gladwell talks about epidemics, right? Epidemics. This term, we know what an epidemic is. I, I, I've been feeling under the weather, so if I came in today and sneezed over on this side of the room, I'm sorry. But you know, I sneezed, right? Just all over you guys. It's all wet. Just, uh, I'm sorry, let me stop, let me stop. You guys on this side are laughing at them like, ugh, nasty, oh my goodness, that's horrible, right? Like, I bet you he's gonna get sick. You might expect the next person to get sick and the next person, but we know epidemics don't work like that, right? It doesn't have to go one person to one person. I might sneeze on this half of the room and by the end of class, this whole room is just Seikani virus up. Right? <laughs> like, man, they got that Seikani virus. Then you all go to your next class, right? Go to poli sci, spread it there. Right by Wednesday, the poli sci department shut down. You guys go to your math class, math department. My stuff is potent, right? So by Friday, you might get an email from Mount Sac. I'm sorry, campus is closed. Say county virus. We got to spray everything with Lysol. <laughs> Remember the flu, right? Think about the flu killing millions of people in the 1920s. The Black Plague kills one third of the population of Europe. These epidemics are no joke. They spread exponentially, right? So Gladwell's going to say we understand epidemics, but think about social epidemics, right? Now we're modern. We think about social epidemics now. Yes? It's all based on food. There are a lot of, there are a lot of theories about it having to do with our food intake. That's, that's something I got to do more. That meat itself causes it? Perhaps. Perhaps. Are you vegetarian? I need to, I need to get some games in the meal. I got to do some things differently. Like the real grill. I got to do some things differently health-wise. Teacher gathers. Mm. This is going to come up in terms of our study of early colonial America, too, and how colonists interact with Native people, the women are doing it, the agricultural work, the, how they looked at that, and how the women of those societies looked at that. It's actually powerful, in a sense. The outsiders are like, look, they're enslaved, they're making them work the land. These women are like, no, we got the food. If you don't act right, you don't eat. Are women supposed to go on the land and do the work? Supposed to? Many folks agree with you. I, I, I'm still weak. I'm, I'm still catching on that dry foot every now and then. That's probably why I'm suffering. It's, it's for real. I've got some issues. I need to. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about that for real. <laughs> I mean, if you think I'm joking, I'm going to ask you some questions about this stuff. Um, examples. I think about the examples he uses to try to prove the rule. And again, I'm not asking that you agree with everything Anderson says or what Gladwell says, but I want you to understand their theories and how we can use them to unpack the stuff we need to unpack. <clears throat> so, we understand this notion of the social epidemic, right? Every now and then, a buddy of mine will send me a, 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 an email or a text. I, I stopped checking my work email at work. Um, you know, I stopped checking emails from my friends at work. Let me put it that way, because I have some buddies that might send you some crazy stuff, right? If I check my email here from my buddy Jose, oh, I might get me fired. 
they play a joke on me, and I'll be like, uh uh-uh. But anyway, a lot of times they'll send me stuff that's very nice and very surprising. I'll get, a, I'll get an email from my buddy who'll say, you know, it'll be like a, a little kitten playing the piano. Look at this. It's cute. It's like, oh, man, you're a thug. Why are you sending me this? But I like it. It's cute. And I look down at the bottom of the email. It says 310 million views. What do we call that? Something goes viral. Epic social epidemic. Right? Think about the technology we now have that something can go viral much easier than it used to be able to back in the day. Right? So we understand this. We understand this completely. So that first example... Right, you may have been a little bit baffled. You're reading this article, and the very first example, the first page is uh, about some shoes. What's going on with the shoes on page one? You might have been reading this and like, why in the world is Satani having reading about some hush puppies? What's happening with hush puppies? Go ahead. Okay. So yeah, these hush puppies are out of style. They're out of fashion. I talked about this fashion example. Um, but something's going to change. And Gladwell is interested in this example because something tips. And he wants to understand why it seems to tip. Right? So yeah, these, these unknown individuals, probably young people, start wearing these, these hush puppy shoes. Right? Now I imagine, because back in the day, I used to ride skateboards. I was a skater back in the day. Had a half pipe in my front yard and everything. I was so popular. Had a lot of friends, not just imaginary. <laughs> now, now that I think of it, maybe they were just coming over to ride my ramp. You know, maybe they didn't really like me at all. I'll think about that later, right? So, anyway, um, skaters and think of like hip hop kids today, right? We feel like you can take something that's not even stylish and make it look cool, right? You could take some shoes that aren't necessarily the most expensive or the most up to date, and you know, make them cool. I remember as skaters, we did that a lot, especially because we didn't want expensive shoes on a skateboard. You'd tear them up. I had a pair of Jordans one time, tore them up on a skateboard. Never again. Right? Never again. And so imagine, I imagine these young kind of hipsters, as they call them, wearing these hush puppies, right? They probably got them cheap because they were no longer in style. They might have got them at the Salvation Army, $2. So they're doing whatever they do during the day in New York City. Now, it's one thing that they wear them, but think about the significance overall here. It's not just that they were wearing these shoes, these no-name people, but it's that some significant figures, some powerful figures, see them wearing these shoes. So imagine Ralph Lauren comes up with like, oh my goodness, are those, are those hush puppies? I haven't seen those since 1984. Oh my goodness. I'll tell you what, I'll give you $1,000 for those shoes. Ralph Lauren walks in here right now and offers me a thousand dollars for my shoes. I'm I'm walking home barefoot. Right? <laughs> but it's because he's so powerful that this is going to tip, perhaps. Right? That this is going to tip. So yeah, a group starts wearing them, but then the right people see them. Ralph Lauren is like, man, I'm going to put those in my my spring line in Paris. Right? People see them in the spring line in Paris. They go viral. Suddenly, hush puppies are back in style. And fashion works that way, right? Fashion, you try to push the envelope. You try to do stuff that people aren't doing, right? So we can understand why something might tip in some unexpected ways. This is why Gladwell is interested in the example. Think about how there might be some unintended consequences. Those little skaters or whatever, they weren't wearing it to cause it to tip. They were just doing what they're doing. But suddenly it's going to tip because of these factors involved. Now, I always imagine the owners of the Hush Puppy factory, they're at Starbucks having a meeting, like, man, our sales are down again. We need to close the factory. Right? They close factories. They're no longer advertising. And suddenly, somebody gets a text message, right? One of them's like, hey, I just got a message that sales are up 500%. And they look around like they think their they're bosses, they think their uh, co-owners are playing a joke on them. Like, Did you just send me this text message? Another lady board member is like, no, I didn't send that. I just got the same message. Sales are up. And they're like, they're baffled. Why? Because they didn't, they didn't have a Super Bowl commercial or any kind of advertising budget increase. These things tip for unexpected reasons. Right? Unexpected reasons caused it to tip. But it does. Think about the power of television, the power of internet, something going viral. Right? Anderson, in his Imagine Communities, was talking about how things like the printing press helped form these communities, right? Help expand communities. In the 1920s radio, right? You listen to the same radio show in New York or LA. Help form a national community in that way. 
So these, these hush puppies may tip for some unexpected reasons. We understand this in terms of fashion. I'll give you one more example real quick. Um, 2008, 2008, Michael Phelps, the swimmer, right? Gold medal swimmer is just mocking everybody up in the pool, right? He's just, he's like swimming backwards with his eyes closed, winning gold medals. It just seemed almost easy for him. He was just so spectacular, right? Michael Phelps' mom became a star in the 2008 Olympics. Unknown before, she's a housewife in the Baltimore area. And she became a star because she's doing what moms do. She's proud of her child, right? Oh, go, baby. Da, da, da. She's cheering. They're like, look at Miss Phelps. You know, once again, her, her son has won an eighth gold medal, right? Well, imagine Michael Phelps goes home. Michael Phelps' mom goes home. And let's say she's doing something. She's doing the dishes at home, right? And the phone rings. She picks up the phone. Michael Phelps' mom. <laughs> so that's how I'd answer the phone. Michael Phelps' mom. Michael Phelps' mom. And the voice on the other end is like, hey, Miss Phelps, how you doing? Well, I'm doing well. You know, first of all, congratulations to your son. He's doing fantastic. We're so proud of him, right? He's really doing the country proud. Eight gold medals. This is fantastic, my goodness. Oh, thank you so much. We're proud of Michael. He's, he's really turned out to be a great boy, this and that. They're like, but yeah, we actually called to talk to you. Oh, really? Me? Oh. Yeah, um, we noticed uh, the black and white blouse you were wearing at the semifinals of the 200-meter breaststroke, let's say. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's my favorite shirt. I got it from Target. It's only $19, but it's so comfortable. I just, it, I love it. It's great. I wear it as much as I can. And they're like, yeah, that's what we want to talk to you about. Um, this is Target calling. If you wear that shirt again to the finals, we'll pay you $450,000. <laughs> now, I would have dropped the phone in the dishes at that point. I would have dropped the phone in a bunch of dishwater. I had to get a new phone. Now, if, I, if my phone rings right now <laughs> and somebody says, say, Connie, we like that blue and purple shirt you had on. You wear it to school tomorrow. We'll pay you $450,000. Guess what I'm wearing tomorrow? <laughs> Guess what I'm wearing the day after tomorrow? Guess what I'm wearing every day this summer? And eventually, you all are going to complain to my boss, like, say, Connie needs to really wash that shirt. Uh, I'm like, nope, I'm wearing it every day, every day they pay. Now, why would they do that? It, it, our target, are they just really nice people? But she's unknown. She's not a significant person. Why do you think that offer might be extended to her? Hmm? I heard something, but I couldn't see. Okay. Yeah, she wasn't famous before the Olympics, but she becomes so. She becomes an influencer, powerful in this way. I saw the same thing with Michelle Obama in the White House. She came in and said, look, I'm not going to wear all these $10,000 dresses. I'm going to try to find everyday styles that people have at Target. So all of a sudden, she wears it. It's sold out. Right? It tips. So it's actually in their economic interest to get Ms. Phelps to wear this again. Right? Think about the Olympics. 200-plus nations competing. Nations competing nonviolently. All these flags. What happens in the Olympics before the games begin? Opening ceremonies. You march in with your flag. Right? Represent your nation. Seven billion people on the planet. Three quarters of them are watching this on television. This is a major venue, especially the visual of television. So it makes a lot of sense for them to do what they were doing. We understand this in terms of both fashion and in terms of some of the vehicles that things might tip. So that, the hush puppy example, I think, is useful for us in a lot of ways. We want to look at a number of factors in impacting the history and how people might become significant. We'll study people whose names we know and some people whose names we don't know and how they're going to be significant for unpacking this history. The second example also comes from Baltimore. Right? What happens in Baltimore right around 1993, 1994, according to Malcolm Gladwell? What's going on in, 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 in Baltimore around that time? Anybody get that far in the article? Yeah. Well, that's the New York example. That's the next one I want to get to. That's the one I want to finish with. But it's right around the same time, too, so it's good. We'll come back to that. Yes. 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 There's an outbreak of syphilis, a syphilis epidemic in epidemic in uh, Baltimore around 93, 94. Now, syphilis is an ancient disease. Right? Why are we so interested in it in 1993, 94? Gladwell feels like we can understand some of the factors involved, perhaps, in it, in it causing it to tip in 93, 94. Well, what are some of these factors then? Because that's what we need to do. We need to be able to pull out certain factors to see. Well, how and why they're going to be significant for the construction of the history we have to study. So what, what do we think 
causes it to tip in 1993 in Baltimore? What are some of the factors involved? Some of them are unexpected, perhaps. Some of them may be unintended. But what causes syphilis to tip in Baltimore around 93, 94? Population, okay, a couple of things with the population will become important. Um, one, they're going to make a point about geography and, and, and some other aspects of population. Yes? Okay. Part of the explanation was that these free health clinics, especially in Baltimore, are going to be shut down. Why? Because the funding was cut, right? Budget cuts, maybe a new political regime comes in. For any number of reasons, budgets might be cut. Now, what this forces us to think about is how institutional forces, right, how larger forces may impact individuals. Right? That's part of what we have to be able to deal with. How is it that bigger overarching forces may impact ordinary people? So he kind of treats this, Gladwell does, as a mathematical formula. Right? And it's kind of something like this. I appreciate Gladwell's ability to use everyday examples. I think his, his ability to break down kind of complicated math into like, Stuff I can understand because I'm not a math person. <laughs> so he, he basically lays it out like this. If before the clinics closed, you had been infected with syphilis, maybe you start feeling bad three, four days after you contract it, let's say. Uh, maybe within a week, you go to get help. Right? You're like, I'm not, I'm not feeling well. Let me go get a shot, a pill, whatever it is you get. Right? Let's say that happens within a week because you got a local clinic that's free that you have access to. But now, all of the free clinics are closed. What if now the nearest hospital is 30, 35 miles away? Or you have to have insurance to get in. You have to have a car to get there, which means you've got to get a day off work. Maybe now, instead of waiting three or four days to a week to get treated, now you wait a month. Maybe I can't get a ride until a month and a half. So Gladwell says that that's going to, in and of itself, cause things to tip because you're infected longer. Right, you have the ability to infect others longer. Just simple mathematics. So again, I'm not saying, you know, some man in a suit in a dark room is like, <laughs> I'll close all the clinics, and that's not what I'm getting at with this example. Right? But even an unintended consequence may have these types of results. A few years ago in California, we were having educational cuts, right? budget cutbacks at the community college level. They weren't hiring here for a long time. Thankfully, three years ago, they were, and I got a job here, <laughs> right? But before that, they were not hiring people. What happens if they don't have enough history one sections? You can't get your classes in time. It takes you longer to graduate, transfer. Right? These unintended consequences can impact individuals. It's a state school, right? We're supposed to be serving the state. What happens if we can't because of money reasons? So economics is important. This is one important factor, these closing of these clinics, even if it may be unintended. What other factors, though? We'll move quickly so y'all can go take a, take a bathroom break. I know you're tired. Besides the closing of the clinics, what else impacts it? You didn't get that far. I know you didn't get to the New York exam. I think the New York one is that far. Yeah. Drug culture, right? The drug culture is going to be mentioned in this one and in the actual the, uh, the New York crime one. This idea that um, folks engaging in certain risky drug behaviors may also engage in more risky uh, behaviors that may spread syphilis, right? So the drug culture is going to be important with this. Um, but, you know, drugs weren't new, right? And even crack had been around for a decade by 93, 94 at least. And so it's a factor, but maybe it's not the only factor uh, in this case. But it is a factor, definitely. Other, other factors you remember? What else causes syphilis to tip in Baltimore, Maryland, 9394? Um, what about the location? What about you the location? Had, you had people from both addiction and drug addiction coming in and going in and they were addicted to mm. drug based syphilis and they were bringing it back to the community. So it could spread, it could tip, it could leave this confined area. There are two ways that's going to happen. One, like you said, maybe it's connected to drug purchasing. And sort of where people live, the geography of this is important, right? Gladwell makes the case that housing itself plays into this. In addition to the drugs, housing itself. One example he uses is the destruction of public housing, low-income housing. Now, I live, when I lived in Maryland, I got to see some of this. Uh, 
because of like the Inner Harbor, Maryland is like a touristy area where the, the harbor is, a lot of shops and stuff, and they built these like million dollar condos overlooking the water. Now surrounding a lot of this is a very low income area. So some of this housing was constructed after the destruction of low income housing. Now, I'm not get, get into all the politics of that, there are various reasons why that may or may not happen. But let's look at this as a math problem first. Let's say you have a low-income housing project, holds 1,000 people. You tear it down, and in its place, you build $50 million condos overlooking the water. You already have a math problem, right? Because at least 950 people are no longer going to have a place to live that had lived there before. Now, it's probably worse than that, right? Because if you were in low-income housing before, you probably can't afford a million-dollar condo the next day. So what happens is one group gets moved out, the other group moves in, whatever. You have a mathematical problem on some other issues. So Gladwell argues that whereas before the syphilis outbreak would have been contained to maybe one neighborhood or one community, like you said, it's going to spread outside of that community. People that now need a place to live might go to a different part of Maryland, different part of Baltimore, different part of Maryland. Some of them may go live with their cousin in New York or find a job in Virginia. And so it leads to a spreading, a tipping of uh, the epidemic. In addition, they're not getting treated as quickly, so it, it can lead to this tip. Uh, this is at least part of the explanation. Think about how all these factors may be working in tandem in some ways, even if they seem like unintended consequences. It's interesting in a sense, right? It's interesting. What we want to do is be able to use this to unpack a variety of factors for getting at significance. Now, last but not least, the New York crime example, right around the same time. Something happens with crime in New York right around 93, 94. What happens with crime in New York right around 93, 94? Yes, first they're talking about how bad crime was, and then all of a sudden it seems to drop. Now, this always makes me think about Biggie Small's first album, right? He's talking about Brooklyn, Vietnam, and AKs and AR 15s and this and that, right? Um, Gladwell is telling stories about people sleeping on the floor, right? Because they're afraid to sleep in beds. High bullets might come in while you're sleeping. And suddenly it seems to tip. Suddenly it seems to stop. And of course, everybody is like very interested in this. Why? Because everybody wants safe streets. And immediately several parties come, come in and say, oh yeah, it's because of us. Right? Crime dropped dramatically because of our group. Who are some of those that claim credit for the crime drop? Law enforcement and the criminals. How about the criminals? Um, so I was looking in the census how crime was increasing. Like, people were getting murdered and stuff like that. That always, that always, I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh at that because it always, I always think of somebody like, I was going to kill you today, but you know what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to beat you up. All right? so, now, it's, it strikes me as an interesting, an interesting theory on several levels. Uh, you know, I was going to commit an armed robbery, but you know what? I'm going to go apply to Mickey D. instead. Come on. <laughs> Now that may that may that may work for a few individuals, but all, did all the armed robbers wake up one day and say, you know what, crack is whack? No, <laughs> no. This may be a longer term factor, but remember, we're dealing with drastic change. Things seemingly changing overnight. So I think that these theories are interesting. I don't expect you or have, you don't have to buy any of them. But think about what's what's being argued. Law enforcement too. You mentioned this. What what happens with law enforcement? Why would they? You can understand why law enforcement would want to claim credit for a crime drop. Crime drop, right? That's their jobs. So you can hear that, you can, you can imagine the chief of police, oh yeah, 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 that's because of us. You know, crime dropped 50%. Um, what happened was our budget increased, right? We hired a thousand new officers. We got these new boots on the ground and of course crime dropped. Now that makes sense. I was late coming to school today, right? So what did I do? I might have been driving 66 miles an hour instead of 65. <laughs> what happened when a law enforcement officer pulled up near me? I went back down to 64. I mean, so Got to get them out set. Thank you. Right. You tend not to commit crime in front of law enforcement. That makes sense. But that tends to explain longer term factors, though. Right. Because even law enforcement officers will tell you, you got to hire folks, go through that process, which can be a long process. They got to go through basic training, right? They got to usually be paired up with a veteran officer to learn the streets and learn what it is their job they're actually supposed to do, learn the communities. That can take a long time. Sometimes it never happens, right? 
that can take years to become an effective law enforcement officer. So even veteran law enforcement folks will say, nah, that takes years for that to kick in. It's not going to happen overnight. But it is interesting. Think about how many parties will have something to gain by attaching themselves to this idea of crime dropping. Who else? Good. Yeah, not just in terms of who's claiming credit, but I should actually phrase it differently. What are some of the explanations, right? So you're right. Economists are like, oh, yeah, the economy got better, right? The, the unemployment rate you know, is going to decrease over time, and education levels rise, and all these sorts of things, which is true. When you have a good job, you tend not to rob a liquor store, right? You tend not to at least feel as desperate, too. You know, some folks, <laughs> well, you know. Um, you're at least less likely to be in that position to feel like that's what you have to do. You feel like you have another way out. Let's put it that way, right? But again, that's a longer term factor. You gotta get a school up, get a good job, get a couple paychecks under your belt. So even economists feel like, yeah, that's a longer term factor. Sociologists weigh in, right? Demographers in particular, and somebody mentioned population earlier. They argue something about the population in New York contributing to the crime decrease. What, what, what do they say about that? This aging of the population, right? Now, I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to offend any of you young people. But basically, the argument is that young people commit more crime. Right? And I, I was young once, so I'm not going to put that on y'all. But let, let's think of it this way. Every now and then, I watch a news story. And the news story is about a grandmother aged lady. So you'll see this lady coming in. Maybe she has a, a walker or something. This always gets my attention because my mom used a walker the last couple of years of her life, right? So whenever I see something on the news, when they're like, look at this grandmother, and she's struggling to get into Wells Fargo, I'm like, oh man, I hope nothing bad happens, right? This lady looks like my mama. If they do something to this lady, right? Please don't let somebody hit her in the head or something, you know? Like, please. Like, I'm only half watching because I don't want to see something bad happen, you know? They're like, watch this lady closely. And she's going into Wells Fargo over here on Temple Avenue. I'm like, okay, what's going to happen, right? She's going in, and she finally gets through the door and asks the security guard a question. I'm like, what's happening? I'm getting frustrated at this point, right? They're like, watch this lady closely. I'm like, I'm watching. And she puts down her purse, pulls out a bandana and a shotgun, and robs the store, right? Robs the bank. Hey, put all the money on the count. I'm like, oh, you didn't expect that, right? You didn't expect bank robbing granny. Right? There are certain ideas we have about who might commit that type of crime. We tend to think younger people would do it. Right? So that, that's kind of the exception that proves the rule in a sense. What we expect in terms of the aging of the population is that, of course, as a population gets older, certain types of crimes will be committed less. But again, that's a longer term factor, even if you do agree with that. Right? But it takes a while for folks to age, for the young people to move out of the community to raise the average age and such. So even that explanation maybe a longer term factor, may not explain the tip. Now what I like about this example is Gladwell doesn't say he has the answer. We don't know why it happens. Maybe it's all those factors together. Right? Maybe it's some strange combination of them. Maybe it's a factor we haven't even accounted for. Now this is what we have to be able to do in the study of history is to look at a variety of factors that may have led to this result. We don't know if just one caused it. We don't know if one led more to, to it than the rest. This is why this concept, I think, can be helpful for us. I don't ask that you agree with everything Gladwell argues. Um, pay attention to how much you hear this term tipping point used, though. It's, it's one of those things that's kind of infected our society. You'll hear it. I hear it on ESPN all the way, on the, my way into work, pretty much weekly. Right? They talked about the tipping point of concussions uh, in the NFL a few years ago and how that's changing things, or may or may not. I mean, tipping point has been used in a wide variety of instances um, I think in part because it's so um, productive uh, a theory. Now, we're going to use it for our own purposes, but I wanted to make sure it was understood. Okay.